everybody. How we doing? Great. What, what a honor and a pleasure it is to follow David Barton, not just to listen to him, but I was a teenager in the 90s when his book Original Intent came out. I didn't read it when I was in high school, but when I went to college, I went to Princeton, and we'll talk about the problems of the Ivy League in a moment. And I, took, I, I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a course on early Christianity. And I walk in my first day. It was taught by Elaine Pagel. She was a very famous pr professor on the Gnostic Gospels. And she walked in and said, this is my statement, refute it. Jesus was uh, buried in a shallow grave and eaten by dogs. This is Christianity as taught, uh, 2001, Princeton. And I remember thinking, I'm, if I'm going to refute this, if I'm going to take this on, I don't know anything about the history of my faith or the history of the role faith plays in my country. So in diving into the origins of my faith, the biblical accounts, how early they were written, how close the the first accounts were to the, when the events happened, you realize the fidelity of the, of the New Testament, of the authors of the New Testament, the firsthand experience that they had. That was never taught. That was never talked about in course. Same thing when it comes to civic life, when it comes to the role Christianity played in the founding of our nation. I showed up at college. I remember reading his book and being told by a roommate, a friend of mine, don't read that radical stuff. None of that's true. Good friend of mine, nice guy, good family. None of that's true. Don't touch that third rail. God has nothing to do with politics at all. Certainly nothing to do with the founding of our nation. You see, those origins that David's been committed to revealing for 30, 35, 40 years uh, are things that have been buried, as you know, for students across our country for far longer than that. And the whole plot and the whole plan is intentional. You see, when I stand in front of audiences, the first thing I say, and I think it connects all of us, most of us, is that I stand in front of you as a survivor. Not just a survivor of my own human nature and sinful nature. It's of course the case. But a survivor of a progressive, godless education that I didn't even know that I received. That most kids in American classrooms today have no idea they're receiving. You see, I grew up in a wonderful Bible-believing Bible Christian home. My parents took me to church every Sunday morning. We went to Awana every Wednesday night. We were, we were Baptist, First Baptist Church. But everything about what happened at church was completely disconnected from what happened at school or every other part of my life. That was intentional, and I believed that the gap between the two was the way things had been and should be. And again, this isn't a conservative, exurb, suburban uh, Minnesota public school. My dad was a public school teacher. All of my mom's siblings are in the public schools. That's what we did, right? Sports, prom, the bell ringing, everything. Public school is good enough for me. It's good enough for my kids. It's the default of what we do. But when David put those three circles up on the screen, church, family, and government, what I see there, he talked about the totality of government, and he's entirely right. What I see is church, family, and government schools. Government schools are the way in which most kids are introduced to civic life. Most kids are introduced to education. And if I thought it was bad in the 90s at Forest Lake Public High School, you see if you watch the Fox News Channel, we broadcast it on Saturday and Sunday morning, the lunacy has only ramped up as the left has become only more emboldened in their schemes coming to fruition. Most people here are survivors of the very same education system. With a government school life completely and intentionally detached from your church life and your home life. Now, I want to salute every pastor, every family of pastors that are in the audience here today. I truly believe that you are on the front lines of America's comeback, of the opportunity for a country that honors God.
not simply because you're in the business of saving souls and cultivating families and, 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 and sharing biblical wisdom and salvation, not, not just because of that, uh, but because it has been the history of our nation. As David has pointed out, as so many others I'm sure have pointed out, it is pastors, preachers, ministers, and others who've led the fight for liberty in America. There is no America, there is no American Revolution, none of that without clergy. Which is why, man, I'm not up here to talk about the Ivy League. But which is why some of you may have seen, about a year ago, I gave away one of my diplomas on Fox and Friends. <laughs> you see, I got a graduate degree from Harvard University at Kennedy School of Government. I foolishly was just, well, which school's the best school? Oh, let me get in, let me get a, a degree from there and I'll be set. The same thing most kids, most families do just by reflex. What will look best on a resume? And as I, my eyes, have, the scales have fallen off and the reality has soaken in of what we're up against, I don't want to have anything to do with any association with an institution like Harvard which is systematically in the business of poisoning the minds of our country. So live on Fox and Friends, my mom was so sad. She said, Pete, don't do that. You worked so hard for that diploma. I ripped the diploma out of the frame, took a Sharpie, and crossed out Harvard University and wrote Critical Theory University, which is what it is. And then I wrote Return to Sender and I mailed it back to him. <laughs> no refund and no reply yet. <laughs> Do you know what the, the straw, what was the straw that broke the camel's back for me? Because there was so much lunacy coming for so, so long out of Harvard. It was the moment that Harvard Divinity, or their chapel, announced that their new head chaplain was an atheist. Harvard, a university founded by Puritans to train ministers. Emblematic of how far we have come as a nation, as descended as a nation, as David has pointed out. So what we need as Christians are three strands of the cord. We need the family, we need the church, and we desperately need the schoolroom as well. Because families can cultivate it, and that's what I'm most focused on as a husband and a father is the cultivation of, there's my friend Carol Swain. When I see Carol Swain, I can't help but smile. She's the best. Cultivation of their souls of our youngest. And then taking them to church so they, so they understand the church community, biblically based, and the importance of, of, of discipleship, as that pastor panel talked about, leading others to Christ, being fortified and bold in our, in, our, in our faith. Those are givens, and I don't have to tell that to this audience. But as David pointed out, we have absolutely given away the classroom to progressives, humanists, atheists, secularists, socialists, Marxists, and communists. In fact, I, I wrote a book. It's out there along with David Goodwin. He's the, the uh, director of the Association of Classical Christian Schools in America. The book is called Battle for the American Mind. And what we did is we looked back at how America's classrooms were captured by the progressive left. A lot of what David, and David knows all these things, so if he's listening, if I get anything wrong, he'll correct me later. As David pointed out, a lot of this emanates from the 60s. That was our working assumption when we started the project. We started the project before COVID, and we can get into the COVID angle of it as well, was that it was started in the 60s. But as we dug deeper, we realized the 60s were just fruit of a poison tree, especially amongst progressives who zeroed in on the schoolroom as the mechanism for societal change. They realized family wasn't going to do it. The church was... Well, the church sways here and fro, as you know, but was an immovable object when God is at the center. But the classroom was something they believed they could capture for their own benefit. And all those categories I just mentioned, when you read the book and you look at the story, to a man and to a woman, they are all humanists, atheists, 
and Marxists. I'm not, I'm not being hyperbolic about that. There are people with very different views of our American founding who saw the classroom as the way to do it. One person they studied, actually, was a, um, a prohibitionist. Her name was Frances Willard from the 1880s. And the reason we know about this is they, write, they wrote about it openly in the New Republic, which was their publish, publication du jour of progressives at the turn of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. So, so they wrote this all down. You just got to go back and look at it through the microfiche. They talked about it. Francis Willard wanted to pro prohibit the consumption and sale of alcohol across the country. And so she said, she set about for ten year, over 10 years, crisscrossing the nation amongst the loose network of, of schools and put in a third grade anti-alcohol curriculum, preaching the, the horrors and harms of alcohol consumption. What happened 40 years later? A constitutional amendment banning the sale and consumption of alcohol. The progressives looked at the classroom and saw it as an opportunity for societal change. I mean, Abraham Lincoln famously said the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation becomes the philosophy of government in the next. Uh, prominent dictators have said very similar things about the power of the classroom. So the progressives said, if we're going to do this, there's one immovable object we have to get rid of. And what was that, what is that one object? God. God had to come out of the schools. Because with God in the schools, there's a reckoning and an understanding of where our rights come from, endowed by a creator. But also how sinful and flawed we all are. That we are incapable of human perfection here on earth. And utopian schemes sold by today bureaucrats or by political leaders don't work. We're not perfectible. And as a result, if you can remove that, you can get into the minds of the youngest of kids uh, and change the way society is oriented. Because the battlefield we've traditionally thought of is in education as freshman year. You know, a kid shows up, he's green, he's on, in college, and the professors try to indoctrinate him. Not anymore. The battlefield today is not freshman year, it's first grade. And that was always the target of the progressive left. There's before, as they sought to get rid of God, there's one word they knew that our founders knew that has been totally forgotten today. We wrote about it a lot in the book, and I won't belabor it, but the word is paideia. Paideia is a lost Greek word uh, that doesn't have a direct translation in English, but it basically, basically means the enculturation or development of our youngest, the worldview we implant on their hearts, the vision of the good life or their affections kids under the age of 12 or 13 hold. You see, most of who we are is formed between the, before the age of 12 or 13. And if you can get kids to think a certain way early on, getting rid of that or dislodging that is really difficult. The, the progressives understood that. And in the early 20th century, I'm talking John Dewey, Woodrow Wilson, that progressive era. At that moment, we still had what we in the book describe as a Western Christian paideia. The paideia of our founding. The paideia he talked, David Barton talked about. In every classroom in America, what was there? There was a Bible and a cross. Public schools. Community schools. Not religious schools. Schools across America. You learn to read from Scripture. It was part of the bloodstream. So the paideia of young kids was one of belief, one of tradition, one who understood the giants of history and the flaws of the human heart. They said, in order to get rid of the Western Christian paideia, we have to start our own schools, and they went about pushing religion into pull-out voluntary periods where parents could opt in or opt out, but they went very gradually because they understood the alarm bells of parents would go off if you remove God immediately from the classroom. Kind of like the alarm bells of the parents at school board meetings these days. They didn't want that to happen. So what they did is they replaced fidelity to the Bible with a, a, a very effective forgery. And this is one of the most disturbing aspects of what David Goodwin and I discovered. I liken our partnership to Indiana Jones. Seen the movies like David Goodwin is Sean Connery with his dusty books and all the clues. And I'm Harrison Ford, I'm just running from the boulder as fast as I can. 
And when I get to that jewel that we were sent to get, what the progressives understood is if you're going to remove God, which was their goal, the forgery has to be something people also value. And so what did they replace God with? They replaced God with allegiance to state. They replaced God with patriotism. They replaced the Bible and the cross with the pledge and a flag. It's a little disturbing. And I love the flag. I'm wearing like three of them right now. (laughs) Because when you fast forward the story, it was never about the flag. They're happy to burn it and throw it away now. That's not what, it it was never about the spirit of 1776 and the first principles that David talked about. Because allegiance to the state or that word democracy is far more malleable than allegiance to an almighty God. And as a result, they could start pushing in different forms of instruction, social study. Who here took social studies? Me too. Invention of the progressives. Not an actual subject until about 80 years ago. It was theology. It was philosophy. It was history. It was civics. Uh, It was literature. Take your pick. Social studies is emblematic of their attempt to reduce men and women and our souls down to a scientific calculation that can be manipulated or understood outside of a biblical context. So all of the assumptions, the things that we think and we know about school, when I say all, I mean almost all. I'd say most are progressive. And that's why I call all of us, most of us, survivors. Because we didn't even know we were getting a progressive education, even if we lived in a conservative community, wherever that may be. Then the Supreme Court went to work. But one little irony of history that makes sense today is while our boys were fighting in World War II in the beaches of Normandy, there were a group of Marxists who fled Hitler in Germany and landed at Columbia University. They were called the Frankfurt School. And the Frank, they, they landed at Columbia University and they came with a new theory. That theory was critical theory. Critical theory's entire premise is to destroy Western civilization, capitalism, uh, free thinkers, deconstruct it, destroy it. What is Columbia University? It's the most preeminent teacher's college in America. So you wonder where critical gender theory or critical race theory came from. It's the 1930s and the 1940s when intellectuals fled Germany, implanted it into the educational pipeline, and it became the philosophy du jour of elite universities for decades and decades, pushed into teachers' colleges, pushed into curriculum, pushed into pedagogy, which is how you teach, not what you teach, based on the word paideia. And soon enough, after COVID and after enough, after they felt like their consolidation was so complete, they popped up and said, Boys are girls, girls are boys, and if you're black, you're automatically oppressed, and if you're white, you're automatically an oppressor. These are based on philosophies that the left has been pushing for a long time, and because of the power of unions, because of the complete takeover of our public institutions, they feel emboldened to do just that. I mentioned the pledge. By the way, our original pledge was, did not say under God. It was written by a socialist. Eisenhower added under God while we were fighting the God, godless communists in the 50s. So the pledge has its place. The flag has its place, but it shouldn't be the center place, especially for Christians and freedom lovers. So after, the, after we had the Western Christian paideia, it became an American progressive paideia from the 60s forward. You get the teachers' unions create the Federal Department of Education with the help of Jimmy Carter. They literally created it. Uh, They brag about it. Jimmy Carter talked about it. They take it over. Howard Zinn does his work writing the most popular textbook in American history called A People's History of America. It's literally American history written from the Soviet perspective. If it isn't in your kid's government school, it's the book by which his his or her textbooks were written. It's in the bloodstream everywhere. Common Core, uh, No Child Left Behind. I'm speeding up the story so fast I can't even think. But they've consolidated every single aspect of the educational pipeline. What we identified is about 2000, 2005, we've entered into what I would call the culturally Marxist paideia. Every single embattlement of government schools 
And, I, and, and here's where I would speak specifically to pastors. It's not just government schools. It's not just public schools. It's definitely almost every single elite K-12 through school. And it is most, most Christian schools, which have a fully progressive educational philosophy with a little bit of God sprinkled on top, which creates the same bifurcation, the same breaking of the strands that exists if you go to a public school over here and a church over there. And so my key message to pastors today is, and I'll quote uh, Charles Potter. He was a fellow traveler of John Dewey. He was a humanist, one of the writers of the Humanist Manifesto, where he said, what chance do the theists, and he meant the Christians, what chance do the Christians have with their one day of Sunday school up against five days of atheistic instruction in between? They knew from the beginning that when Christians retreated to Sunday school because the government got in the business of education, that the atheists would go to work while we were absent. I implore on the heart, I say this as someone who, I heard the pastor's panel before this, who grew up in a seeker-sensitive church in Minnesota. God, God bless him. The church exploded, but the culture eroded around it. And nothing was done about it, nothing was addressed. There, there were classical Christian schools clamoring for support and the church wouldn't touch it. I hope that's changing a little bit today, but for decades the church, no, we don't do education. We don't talk about policy. We don't talk about politics. Let's hope COVID was a moment where churches woke up to the reality of what the government will do to you. <clears throat> so if you're not in a place where you can start a classical Christian school or a biblically-based Christian school, then I hope pastors will stand in front of their congregations and say, where do your kids go to school? What do they teach? And what assistance can we give to help you get your kids out of atheistic government instruction? Because I'm living proof of what chance do you have. One hour on Sunday night, one hour on Sunday morning, one hour on Wednesday night, and 40 hours in the middle of the week. You actually don't. But by the grace of God, am I standing before you as the most flawed human being the world has ever seen. Saved only by grace. But when you see what the progressive left has done, you cannot unsee it. You cannot turn away and say, no, that education thing's not my thing. The church was in the business of education at the time of our founding. Why did we decide it's just a one hour a week function and that the government should have the responsibility the remainder of the time? There's things policy-wise that we should do. School choice is one of them, where the parents are given the dollars to choose the school of their choice to include religious instruction. <laughs> to include homeschooling. Absolutely. I think you're going to hear a little bit from classical conversations. Lee Borton's a dear friend of mine. Like what they're building there with classical Christian homeschooling is so important. It's the 15th, I think, 15th largest school district in America if you add up classical conversations. There is a way to educate your kids that taps into the wisdom of our founding generation. It's based on biblical truth that studies Latin and Greek and philosophy, that identifies fallacies, that teaches kids to speak well, write well. They teach phonics. Did... <laughs> I remember when I was... I remember when I was in high school, or what, junior high, high school, and those commercials came out that said, Hooked on Phonics works for me. I remember making fun of those and be like, who are the kids that need Hooked on Phonics? They must be dumb. I was the dumb one. I can't even conjugate a verb. I don't know what it means. I just write books like I talk. And I mean that. Because they abandoned that in the name of educational philosophy into the whole word method. Because it was the new educational fad. And what happened to reading scores? <laughs> In the process. And then they just make up a new reading philosophy, never going back to the wisdom of the past because there is wisdom in what our forefathers understood to be good and right and true and beautiful. So thank you for being here. Thank you to Turning Point Faith 
for leading this charge. Man, has this been needed for so long. God bless you all. Thank you so much.